Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another outstanding author and chess player joining us this week. He has recently released his 40th chess book uh, called Opening Repertoire 1D4 to C4. Uh, He's been teaching chess for about four decades, a prolific and widely read author. His book Chess for Hawks won the Best Instructional Book Award from the Chess Journalists of America. Um, Kind of a... um, a uh what's the word for cyrus you're the writer what's the word for someone who's like um constantly uh, present Academy in american award. chess emmy emmy award <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh bit, you know popular and well-known chess author i am cyrus lakdawala thank you for joining us cyrus uh, thanks for having me ben i'm sure people would have loved to hear me search for a word for an hour straight and that's the interview but <laughs> pr- probably better if we just keep moving um so you've got this new book, Cyrus, 40th uh-huh. book, first of all, which is a topic of, of its own, um, but uh-huh. new book uh, called Opening Repertoire 1D4 2C4, where you lay out in the beginning um, how you at the, are you 59 or 60, Cyrus? Um, I'm actually 58, but I'm about to turn 59. Ah, okay. Uh, so happy birthday in advance. But Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, no birthday... No birthday after forty is happy, by the way. You yeah, know? I'm I'm there with I'm there with you. Like you. Each one, you know, like you 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 visualize the grave closer and closer, <laughs> you know. So Yeah, I'm forty two <laughs> and I'm feeling it every day lately. So I mean I don't want to get too morbid. Everything's fine. But, <laughs> but in any event, so you're fifty eight, soon to turn fifty nine, and you decided to uh switch opening repertoires to switch from in your own words uh openings that i mean i don't know what the most politically correct way to say l- less brave openings to something right. uh, a little right. more feisty I, I i've actually got like the chicken market cornered in in chess writing you know like i'm the go-to guy if you're a giant chicken you know like dove strategist i'm your go-to guy this is like the this is one of the first uh, really aggressive repertoires I've written, and uh, it, it actually came about, uh, uh, I, I play in this uh, weekly Gambito, now I play every, every two weeks in it. Uh, it's, a, it's a rapid tournament on Saturdays. Uh, I don't have time to play every week anymore, but it's four rounds, and uh, I lightly annotate my games and I send it to a group of people, uh, a lot of title people and students. And uh, I am Tony Sadie is on that list. And I sent him this game where, uh, you know, I was black in a Slav and I ground down some uh, high A player in 80 moves. And uh, he sent me this wicked email. uh, Like, you know, basically it was a, uh, I'm sorry, I I was not black. I was white and I played some Collie or something like that. And uh, he sent me uh, one of those, uh, you are a disgrace to the white pieces <laughs> emails, you know, like, oh, no. And um, he actually told me to write this book. He said, I want you to switch repertoires uh, to an aggressive D4, C4, stop being such a chicken. Um, he ranted about Wolf Anderson, you know, b- ruining me. <laughs> um, <and then> he <laughs> But he basically told me to write an aggr- as aggressive a repertoire as I could think of. And uh, I, I, when I do have the courage to play it, I so far have a 100% score with it at the Gambito. So it's, uh, I was kind of shocked. I played like the white side of a Nimzo Indian on a 2150, and he got mated in about 20 moves. And I, I went like, whoa, like I never win a game in under 100 moves, right? I mean, I... <laughs> I like, all my games are like opposite colored bishops endings where I, you know, win by one tempo on move 99, which zigzags the guy. You know? right. like, like I totally rely on, on uh, technique. Uh, you know, I stay completely clear of, of tactics, complications, unclear positions. And I've done that since childhood. I was like that since I was like eight, you know. P- playing old man chess since you were a young man. I was an old man when I was eight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's, I mean, it's interesting. It must be interesting to try it out uh, <laughs> later in your chess career. Um, so was it hard to pull the trigger? Um, I mean, so it, it was, it was, um, uh, I, one of my main rivals is this, uh, Mexican I am named, uh, Dionisio Aldama. He comes, I call him the poacher because he comes up from Tijuana and he poaches my territory <laughs> here in San Diego. But, uh, one time when I wasn't playing, we were playing blitz and just as a, you know, I, I just, as a joke almost, I, I didn't think, I thought I would lose every game doing it. I, I played this repertoire on him and uh, like I won four whites in a row in the blitz games. And uh, I went, Hey, uh, maybe have I been wrong for the last 50 years, basically, you know, like have I been, have I got it completely opposite of how I should have been playing for the last 50 years? Well, you've done okay for yourself. I mean, you've been over 2,600 USCF, right? Uh, I I don't know that I've been over. I think I, I, I know that I've been twenty five ninety nine or ninety eight, but I don't know if I, I mean with rating inflation today it would be probably about twenty six forty maybe. Okay, that was in the that was in the mid nineties. I was about twenty five ninety eight. Okay, spitting distance. now you know like it's like forget it. I'm like uh, I fell below twenty five hundred for the first time in. Uh, in about 35 years. And it just felt really weird going below 2,500, you so, know, like it just, it, it felt really strange. Like, like, Oh my God, like, uh, I'm Superman picking up kryptonite or something. Right. You just, you just feel this drain of your, your former self, you know? Well, no one escapes father time. So, no, we, and no. we've had, uh, we've had some other older players like, uh, Michael Road and John Watson, and they've talked about what's, what's different for them when they try to play. Um, what, what about you? So is there something concrete that, that you're noticing that's making, I mean, uh, obviously 2,500 is still plenty good. Um, but is there, is there something that's, that's recurring that's, that's causing your rating to drop a bit? It's fatigue blunders. It's just fatigue blunders. I, I actually had a heart attack in uh, 2016 at the Gambito in the first round. Um, like a jackass, I played the entire tournament after having the heart attack. Wow. In like excruciating pain, I, I was too stupid to go into the emergency room. And I went after the tournament. I won 4-0, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I went out in the... Like my wife was like yelling at me, my cardiologist was yelling at me, and I was going, but 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 I was leading the tournament. You know? <laughs> like, I had a winning position in round one. There's no way I'm offering a draw in that game. That's if funny. I have a winning position and have a heart attack, I'm playing it out. And then <laughs> I couldn't get myself to withdraw in round two because I thought, well, I'm one zero. I could, you know, I could win the tournament. I I can't leave now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you but, survived. <laughs> well, thank you. It, it, it wasn't from intelligence, let me tell you that. <laughs> you know, the, the cardiologist told me, uh, <clears throat> you know, the bottom third of your heart has no electricity in it right now. Wow. You know, you know, oops, uh, maybe Man. I should have gone in earlier. <laughs> Yikes. <clears throat> well, like I said, I, I'm I'm glad it worked out. And yeah, so you, you say that fatigue is the, the primary cause, which is uh, the common answer. Although, do you think that playing game 45 as your primary um, mode of competition now, does that help much or? It helps because I only play one day. I, I could never play a three day tournament. My, my rating would be 1300 if I played like the slow games three days. First of all, I have a bad back and there's no way I could I could sit more than one day at a time. Um, I write all my books like, you know, propped up with pillows in bed on my laptop. You know? Okay. But um, uh, there's no way I could play a three day tournament anymore. I, I just declined a entry to the state championship uh, finals. Like I, I, I qualify every year on rating and I haven't played in, uh, in eons, you know, because I, I, I just can't play that many days in a row. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, and uh, as you get older, I know you mentioned that you'd, you'd had your kids, I think from what I gather are a little bit older, but you've, you've had kids. So there's, yeah, the... I have one son. He, he's 28. Okay. So there's the, the health issues that you mentioned and also sort of the opportunity cost of being away from work and family make it tough. That's um, the problem. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, I play in this, in a rinky dink Gambito. I shouldn't say that because anyone <laughs> listening from the Gambito will get mad, but it's a rinky dink tournament. It's a, 
I, you know, there's, there's usually one other I am that's Aldama, Dionisio Aldama. And uh, the, I usually play like uh, two masters and one expert. So it's usually one I am, two masters, one expert in my game. So it's not, it's not a weak tournament, but it's not like an I am tournament or a GM norm tournament either. You yeah, know? or even like the New York Masters. I mean, you exactly, exactly. You play in but, San Diego. But, you have to, you have to play the people that live there. Yeah, we actually have. Uh, we don't have. Um, that you know that many title players there's john watson there's me and there's also larry evans uh the the i am larry evans not the gm passed away larry evans right um but uh we have a huge huge number of uh gifted uh juniors in san diego yeah was it uh keaton kirwa from there or is he keaton kira is, is yeah Key, oh, I forgot. I completely forgot about Keaton. He's like my co-author of one of my books. Okay. Him. Oops. Uh, sorry, Keaton, if you're listening. <laughs> it's like Russia, if you're listening. <laughs> right, sorry, yeah. Keaton, if you're listening. <laughs> so yeah, Keaton is, uh, he's kind of the king, you know, because he's a young guy. I think yeah. He's like 31. So he's the king of San Diego. I, I, even though our ratings are the same, I consider him the king. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you've probably played, despite uh, having worked with him at times, you've probably played him a bunch. And how- uh, he doesn't play in the Gambitos because uh, you know he just he he wants to. He has two GM norms. He wants to make GM. He only plays in like major tournaments. Okay, but uh, you know he loses money uh, every time he plays in a Gambito, as do I. Like okay, like I, I charge sixty an hour. If I play in the Gambito, uh, I could do six hours of lessons. That's my heaviest day, Saturday, Sunday, right? So yeah. I lose six, you know, six, uh, you know, three hundred and sixty dollars. I, I lose just in that. Plus, I can't write that day. And what am I playing for? Like one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Yeah. You know, like so, it's like I'm playing just to pl- to not get worse. I, I play to not get rusty, and also I need to feed my my books with my own games because that's sort of my my trademark where I, you know, if I write a book on a certain opening, I play that opening, no matter how uh, imbecilic I do it. I, I, I still play it to show people that you can learn an opening and play it. Yeah. And I think it's a good way to approach it. I mean, a lot of authors uh, have sort of a more academic um, approach to writing a book where they just look at the elite level yeah. games. I don't like, I, I've i never liked that style. Of course, like, that's how almost all chess books are written. But uh, I I kind of decided on my very first book, like, uh, I didn't think I would ever write a second book, right? When you're offered a book deal, you, you think this is it. Right. And so I thought, you know, chess books are essentially boring. Uh, for me, from my perspective, from my uh, perspective, they're, they're pretty boring. And... Uh, I I think that they need to be um, uh, a simulation of either a lesson or an analysis session with a higher rated friend. Sorry, that's my phone going off over over in the other room. No worries. Um, uh, but uh, they need to be fun. You know, they, they, it, it has to be like a chat with a friend where there should be humor. Uh, there should be scoldings if mm-hmm. if necessary. There should be encouragement, but it should be like a conversation, not like a, a a professor lecturing at the podium and you taking notes. I I, I think that's um, that's an ineffective uh, way of learning. Also, I think they should be very uh, interactive. I I always put in lots of. Uh, questions you know puzzles uh planning exercise what would you do here critical decision uh you know moment of contemplation what would you do here you're busted what you know there is no good move what is your least worst move (laughs) something Mm -hmm. like that but you must interact with the reader i i I don't like distance between myself and the reader yeah of course this causes problems because i I use a lot of humor in my books, so it's like I'm, I'm I, I consider like myself like simultaneously uh, the most loved and hated chess writer. Uh, I have I have um, what you would essentially be call super fans, you know, where they're just absolutely crazy about my writing style, 
And then I have these super non fans, you know, <laughs> who, uh, you know, when I post on Facebook, here's my next book, uh, vomit emoji, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's harsh, uh, man. <laughs> not, you know, poop <laughs> emoji, that, that kind of, that kind of guy. Like, you know, and I, 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 I factor that in. It's, I, I factor in that about 20% per- of the, the chess, uh, readers don't like my style. And, they really, really don't like my style when they don't. Okay. Like my books, like actually annoy them or irritate them. But when they like my style, they, they're just gaga about it. You know, like, uh, I get, I get emails every day about, you know, like how wonderful the writing is, but, uh, those are the friends. I'm sure I would get emails every day about how crappy my writing is if I <laughs> friended the vomit emoji guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't please everyone, right? As lo- I mean, it that, seems like you found an audience. It. That's how I see it. Nobody's forcing you to buy my book. If right. you don't like my style, don't buy it. You yeah. know, uh, the, you know, I, I have, uh, not only just reader critics, I have, you know, like, uh, the USCF, uh, critic, hates my style but he he does factor it in he says i don't like his style but he looks at other other aspects of the book but you know i i can't help it if you don't like my style sorry i yeah well i have to cop to i have to cop to being friendly with john hartman who who you're referring to (laughs) oh okay (laughs) um and and he's been on the show but but Uh i mean and I, i i i to be honest i i hadn't read your books until uh until we were leading up for this interview, and I read uh-huh. uh, I read D four and C four and looked uh-huh. through Chess for Hawks. Um, I I didn't read the whole thing, but I um I get that I like I see that it's a unique style, and I totally see what you're saying. I, I can uh-huh. see how it would be polarizing because it's very personal, right. Um, right. and and the the sort of uh, jokes and self flagellation comes fast and furious. So right. like that's you know that's going to really resonate with some people and not with others. Exactly. Exactly. I just as long as the majority like it, I'm I'm happy. Yeah, I, I, know, I know that twenty percent is going to be there. I, I I factor it in. I, you know, and uh, sometimes I do consciously try to tone it down, but I I I I almost can't. It's like once I start writing, um, it's like the 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 writing sort of takes over, and I like I make a decision. Okay, I'm going to try to be more serious this book and it never works out i just once i start writing it just goes its own direction you know so so you you find it easier to switch your opening repertoire than your your writing style yeah there's no way i can switch my writing style it's like it's impossible it's just it it's just the way it is you know yeah i mean also if you're you know (coughs) still getting book deals on your 40th book um must be doing something right that, that's how I see it, you know. I mean, I there's almost never a time where I'm not writing two books uh, at the same time. Yeah, so that's crazy I, I, to me. So I saw an old interview, well, not old, I think it was from March, with uh, David uh, Nastasio um, of Georgia Chess News, I right, believe it was called. Right. Um, and in that interview, you mentioned you spend about 40 hours, oh man, I can't even remember the hours, but I believe it was 40 hours a week it's, writing and 20 teaching, yeah, is that right? Yeah, I spend uh, approximately forty writing and uh, between twenty and twenty three teaching. I, I'm I'm always maxed out on teaching because my demand the demand for lessons is way more than the time I have. And if I was smart, I would do it the other way, where I you know I would do twenty hours of writing and forty hours of teaching. Oh, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, you got cut off for just a second. Okay, we got okay. we got everything. So keep going. Okay. Um, but, uh, I'm, I've been a, I've been a writing addict since I was a kid. I, you know, I, I tried to write a novel like when I was in third grade, it it did not go well, but (laughs) I I was also a syndicated columnist in my early twenties. I believe I'm the youngest, uh, syndicated columnist ever for Copley news service. I had a chess column in about 300 newspapers in the eighties. All through the eighties, wow, and wow. early nineties. <clears throat> and so you've got forty hours writing and twenty hours um, teaching. What about just keeping up with chess? Does that go in the writing category? Because obviously, that's kind of part of your job. Um, I, you know, I don't. Uh, I kind of keep up with chess by other people telling me things. You know, right. it's, it's kind of weird. Like a. I, I'm simultaneously on Facebook while I write, so it's constantly interrupted. 
And, uh, I, you know, I have a million chess friends, and so I know what's going on in the chess world. I, I'll just click on a link, and there I know what happened. Or, and, and I do follow uh, big tournaments, you know, like if it's, uh, you know, like Carlson's Granky uh, mm-hmm. tournament or, uh, you know, any, any world-class tournament I do follow. Are you, do you ever watch the broadcast or are you just kind of pulling up the positions? Uh, I tend to pull up the positions later, but I do watch the broadcast because I think it's very instructive to uh, hear uh, title players give commentary while the game is in progress. It's very important to try and guess the moves as the game is going on. Um, there's kind of this, and I never, never turn on a computer when I, uh, when I watch a world-class uh, player play. Uh, let's say I'm watching Carlson and Caruana in their world championship match. Um, everyone has their computer on. And uh, there's this mass delusion in chess that, uh, you know, Carlson and Caruana are really weak because they didn't make the, uh, you know, 3,300 rated computer move on yeah. that move, you know. And some, you know, honestly, like players that are like 1,300 will say, what a fish, you know, Carlson, what a fish. He didn't find the move. You wouldn't have found the move if you were given a million years. You found the move in quotation marks because that computer was on. You yeah. know? And so the, the illusion is that you would have seen it and that you wouldn't have seen it. That's the thing. And so um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a, kind of like an anti-computer guy, but of course that makes me uh, ridiculous because, the, you know, progress isn't going to be stopped. You know, we're not going to go back to horses and, and right. Buggies, right? So, but I think for chess, I think it's harm chess. It's made players stronger, but it's, um, something has been lost. Like we don't think anymore. We want instant answers. We've become like the, um, the spoiled kid that wants instantly. Like I want this thing, mommy, I, you know, I, you, you pass by the toy store. I want this one. I want this one. And we're instantly fulfilled by the computer. There's no, there's no strain of trying to find the move. And I think that's very important for chess development. <clears throat> that's good advice. So what's your philosophy when you're writing? How do you use or not use engines? Uh, I go through the game first without an engine. And I actually kind of jot down my my impressions, uh, then of course I have to use the engine because, you know, like, uh, uh, oops, I overlooked a mate in one, you know, yeah. I have to see that mate in one. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, the second time I go over it with the engine, but I don't do it the first time because I, I think it colors your view. It, it's that same illusion where you would have, this is obvious. This is obvious. This is obvious. You know, it's not obvious. It, like, without the computer, that's what you're really thinking. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I'm kind of stunned at how uh, wide the the variance is of what I looked at and what the computer claims. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can have this <clears throat> feeling like you're doing well in a position, and then it's like, you know, minus one and a half or something, as it turns out. Um, oh, or minus six. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> And so when you're playing games, do you, uh, do you have positions? I mean, you must, everyone does where you, you feel like, you know, there's a tactic and you don't find it. And then you like, when it's over, do you have these moments where you want to check the engine right away? Or or is your having come up in the pre engine age, are you willing to just sort of look first and then turn on the engine later? No, I look first. I don't want that engine on. I don't want that engine on. Anyway, people tell me, you know, because you listen to the the kibitzes and things and everybody has their engine on. And so they're always telling me. So it's like, it's very hard to not know what the engine is, is thinking. Yeah. So but it's actually impossible to actually look at the game without an engine. If you're watching a broadcast, for instance, well, what about with your own games? No, with my own games, I never use the engine. Wow. But, I mean, I, I, I use it. This, like I say, I, I always go through a game twice. Second time I use the engine. Okay. And how long do you spend? So they're they're not super long games. I mean, it's game forty five. Uh, so how long would you spend analyzing a typical game of yours, or writing oh, down your thoughts? Mine, if it's not for a book, it's very quick. It, like I send I send games filled with typos and 
you know, <laughs> I, like you know, bam, it's out there. You know, just first impressions. But so, for a book, it's much different, of course. You know, right. you, you slave over the games, and you, you know, you 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 have to make sure the analysis is correct. You have to make sure that your prose is is not foolish. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> so speaking of your your books, we have um we have another. We have a question from a supporter of the podcast, uh-huh. uh, actually, and this one doesn't relate to your um, your most recent opening repertoire book, but one of your prior open, opening sure. repertoire books. Uh-huh. Um, so it is from Robert Huizar. I should have asked him how to pronounce that, of mm-hmm. Lone Pine Chess, which I am confident I know how to pronounce. Um, so Robert at Lone Pine, Lone Pine Chess asks... Uh, he says, it seems there are two current Carol Khan focused books on the market by the same publisher, uh, uh, Huska's and Lakdawalla. Um, I have two Carol Khan books, though. Do you? From, from Every Man. Yeah. One is the one with Keaton Kira with uh, one dot 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 C6, which is Carol Khan and Semislav. Oh, Robert. interesting. And the other is uh, Carol Khan Move by Move. So I'm not sure which one he's talking about. Okay. He mentions this. He mentions the C6 book. So he. Um, Oh, I, that's the one with Keaton then, maybe. Okay. Okay. So he says, the lines he currently <laughs> know have come from Huska's Carol Khan 2007. Mm-hmm. As an adult improver who looks to use C6 as his main repertoire, Pizza's Black, can you explain how your approach to the Carol Khan in your book, C6, is different from hers and why I might want to pick up your C5 book So, I, um, when considering future Carol Khan study? So basically, plug your book. <laughs> Wow, uh, I haven't looked at the Huska book for probably ten years, so that's a tough question. Uh, I um, I don't. I remember. Um, I'm trying to remember her lines. Like, okay, like on the main line, um, she gives a line um, with Queen A five check, as I remember, uh, to prevent White from castling Queenside. Ours, Keaton, in my book. We actually go for opposing wing attacks. We castle kingside and let white castle queenside. And uh, it's a it's a much sharper position, but I think black is just fine in the main line. The, the, the line that's the trickiest, I think, is the advance. That's the hardest line to deal with in uh, the Karakhan, I think. Oh, yeah. The, the, the C6 repertoire book is actually not my repertoire, it's uh, it's based on the repertoire of uh, Dreyev and Kenkin, who who have amazingly similar repertoires. Uh, what happened was uh, Keaton was actually not supposed to be the co-writer. The co-writer was supposed to be Joel Sneed, Professor Joel Sneed. Uh, he he was uh, originally at Columbia. Now I think he's at Queen's University. He's a psychologist there, and he's written many books with uh, Bor- in conjunction with uh, Boris Golko. And he's one of my students, and he wanted to write a repertoire for himself that he plays. And uh, he actually came up with this idea, and we were going to write the book together. But then what happened was he he essentially got a promotion uh, from Columbia University to uh, head of uh, clinical psychology at Queen's University. And uh, he got swamped with work, and he could not... Uh, he could not do the book essentially, and okay. so uh, I went with Keaton instead, which is a little bit bizarre having a, a teacher student book when the uh, the other guy has the same rating as you. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. The, I guess it's the hubris of age, you know. Where <laughs> <I mean, laughs> I'm the teacher, we're rated the same, but I'm much stronger. I know so much more, much wiser. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, it's good to get two two people's perspective in the book. Right. And yeah. And just to clarify, I just saw at the end of the question, he does say that uh, that Huska's book um, was revised in 2015. So okay, um, I do. I don't have that. Yeah. Have- so yeah. I mean, and I think it's a, an awkward. Uh, I'll do respect to Robert, but I think it's kind of an awkward position to. I did want to ask his question, but to ask an author to directly compare the book to a competitor's book because I mean, there's a good chance both books are good. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I mean, I- I don't even consider her a competitor. I mean, right. it's just, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I get that. I mean, we're we're all one family in the chess world, and, you right. know, we all right. want want to get better. But on right. the other hand. And it's the same publisher, too. I mean, right, you know, yeah, that's a good point. 
<laughs> but on the other hand, people, <clears throat> not everyone is going to buy two opening books on the same opening. So, right. I, you right. know, I, I can get how he would want to contrast them. Um, right. But, but it, you know, that was 2015. I don't know when the C6 book, I guess, was 2017. So they are close. You're right. I, I think it might have been 2018, though. I, I, I don't remember the date. The yeah. publishing date might have been 17, though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some more general advice might be just to look at the lines and uh, getting back to your your uh, hawks and doves uh, construct. I mean, basically, you can look at the lines and see which one suits your style more. Well, that's I'm sure. the thing. Robert, you know, the, the, the person who ends. Uh, is it Robert? The yes, person Robert. Who asked yeah. The question? Uh, just use the force, Robert. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, go go with what you feel. I mean, you. You feel, I, I want to play this line, and I don't want to play this line. You have to go with what you feel. And, of course, the bottom line is what you score, but not always. Like, for instance, we were just talking about this. I apparently score incredibly well with this uh, super aggressive D4, C4 repertoire. The problem is I feel like I'm going to have a second heart attack every <laughs> game I play it. So I'm not sure I want to play it, even though I score well with it. I, I don't want to be uncomfortable all day every you know every right. other saturday you know like i like my dullard collies and and londons and trompowskis and ulf anderson repertoire lines you know I, like i've done it my whole life i it, but it is a nice change it is a nice change you know but yeah. uh, basically you got to go with your heart you know whatever you feel you have to l like your line i think that's actually very important what uh, people may not know is you actually have to love your line once i start not liking a line and i fall in and out of love all the time with these lines i've played for the last five decades right i've been playing french since i was eight you know modern mm -hmm. since i was eight uh and you know at, at a certain time i will you know throw a fit um, and say uh i refuse to play french ever again because uh you know, eight lower rated players in a row hit me with exchange French. And like, you know, you of course want to strangle them when <laughs> they do that. Right. And so you, you think French is unplayable. And then a, a few months later you ask for forgiveness and you come back to French. Right. You know? it's just, and so, and, and, it, and it's the same way with particular lines within an opening, you know, uh, you have to like it. You, you have to think it's fun to play. I think that's actually more important almost than how you score with it. Yeah. You have to have that enthusiasm factor, you know, in it. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, yeah, I've I've said this before, <laughs> but this is a hobby. It's supposed to be fun. So That's the whole thing. If you're not a professional player, um, we play for the, the joy of the game. It's really not about the score. We, we'll never admit that, of course. It's it, like... Uh, you know, every student I have, they, their goal, I want to improve. Is, is that really the goal, though? It, shouldn't it be the, for the joy of the game? I mean, I, I, I happen to, I mean, I'm not a professional level player by any means now. You know, old age is seen to that. But, like, I used to be. And I had to win. Okay. This was before books. And, uh, you know, I was broke, professional chess player. So I had to win, and that was top priority. But now I don't have to win. You know, yeah. I, I have nothing to prove. I'm an old man who likes to play chess, right? So I want to play what's fun. Yeah. I, I want to play what I want to play. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's really great advice. I, yeah, I, I think it's um, important to maintain that perspective. Um, and speaking of, of what you want to play, so I mentioned the uh, from Chess for Hawks, the uh, Hawks and Doves sort of construct that you lay out in the introduction. For people who haven't read that book, could you could you um, explain a little bit uh, how you categorize chess players and how it's uh, impacted you? Well, uh, all I mean, I would say ninety five percent of chess players fall into the category of hawk or dove. Okay, uh, you know, hawks are natural tacticians. They like open positions. They're aggressive. Um, they have an uh, outward polarity. Their their first thought is, uh, what can I do to the opponent? The dove is is like a defensive player. They tend to be good in simplified positions. They tend to be uh, good in endings. 
Um, they choose chickenish openings. Um, I, I mean, uh, I I was branded a dove, you know, when I was eight years old. Uh, I mentioned in the introduction of the book, like I I made some super passive move, and the teacher called me a sissy, <laughs> and. I even today I remember the the laughter ringing in my ears of the the, the, the lunch members of the chess club like ha 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 you're a sissy you know and I realized then oh my god I'm a dove you know right <laughs> and no matter how many tall games I studied it it, it I I couldn't stop being a dove I play like Ulf Anderson I I I you know I I play like a a crappy Ulf Anderson and a really crappy Capablanca. And <laughs> I can't help it. You know, that's it. You know, <laughs> so I what, can't be tall no matter how much I try. I can't be Morozovich. I can't be tall. So what advice do you, so how does that frame one's approach to chess? So should you well, lean into your strengths or yes, worse? Okay. Yes. Lean into your strengths. You have to pick openings, which suit your, your style, not what you want. Okay. Like uh, we all want to be tall. Okay, we all want to dazzle, but we we're not all tall. You know, that's that's the problem. There was, you know, there's very few talls out there. So uh, it, if you now, I'm I'm heavily a dove. Most people are kind of closer. There there may be like forty sixty. I'm like a I'm closer to a ninety ten. You know, a ninety percent dove, ten percent hawk. And I, I'm a hawk only distastefully when I'm forced to be a hawk. No, no other time am I, am I a hawk, you know? Right. Um, so, uh, but you have to first, you have to choose your openings correctly. Like, let's say uh, I have a game in there against Aldama where I'm, he was leading in the Gambito. It was the final round. And uh, I had the black pieces. Okay, so he only needed a draw. So uh, he played E4. Well, should I play, uh, you know, should I play a Nadorf? Should I play a Dragon? No, I would get killed in 20 moves in a Nadorf or Dragon. I played a Karkon and beat him, mm-hmm. right? You play into your strength. It doesn't, you don't go, uh, well, I can't play Karkon because it's too drosh. You, you know what I mean? I'm going to yeah. play a Slav on you. If I need to win in the final round, I'll probably play a Slav on you. Yeah. It, 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 even though... Uh, I should be playing a Grunfeld or a King's Indian or a Benoni or a Banco Gambit. I'm still going to play Slav because I play Slav better than King's Indian, Benoni, or Banco Gambit, you know, or yeah. Grunfeld. That makes sense. So how many how many times do you think you've played Saldana? Oh, Aldama over 100 Al- games. Aldama, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm always yeah. curious about these uh, these inner town rivals, but rivalries. Well, he's, he's got a huge advantage because he's 10 years younger. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, we, I think we've played over. I haven't counted, but uh, Jeremy Silman. To, uh, I sent him. Uh, I sent him my games, and he told me that we've played well over a hundred times. Wow. Uh, that, that, so, how often are you switching up the openings <coughs> against him? <clears throat> um, uh, I don't switch. You know, uh, he switches. I corner him. Is what I do. Um, like I just keep repeating the opening over and over and over. And he tries new things, but after a while, he he has to run out, right? Yeah, like he has to run out. What I what I do with him is I do the classic uh, dove strategy. When I'm white, I'll play either London or Torre or Ulf Anderson repertoire, and uh, he gets really frustrated, you know, and and uh, he has a hard time complicating. I will, I will make the game as dull as possible. <laughs> so it's so, a like, clash yeah, between a hawk and a dove. Yeah, oh, he's a super hawk. I mean, he's a crazy... He's as much a hawk as I am a dove. Wow, must be interesting he, he, games. He, he truly is like tall, like a weak tall. And I'm like a weak Capablanca, you know? So, uh, it, it's... Um, we. I should probably qualify that super weak Capablanca. Not, not just weak, <laughs> super weak. Okay. You know? But uh, still, um, it, it, you have to enforce your will... On the board, I know if he opens that position and he makes it a mess, my odds are not good. Okay, my odds go down to about twenty five percent, twenty percent. If he makes the position irrational and open, um, he's going to win four out of five. But if I can, if I can make the position painfully dull, uh, all technical, it's going to be the opposite. 
you know, where he'll only score draws and never win, only draws and losses and not win. So we both know this, and we both try to enforce our will upon each other. It seems, it seems to me like uh, the Dove would have an advantage in this scenario. Don't you think it's easier to steer towards a, a boring position than to, to muck things up no matter what? No. no. Is it easier to build a building or blow it up? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a lot easier to, to plant a bomb and blow it up. It takes a year to build the building. It takes, you know, maybe a month of preparation to blow it up. Yeah, but I mean, he's playing like a twenty. I mean, you're a twenty five hundred player, so okay, you're you're tactically weaker than like you're not as good tactically as positionally, but you're you know you're not gonna you're not gonna hang your queen to a knight for no, it. Or no, no, I I understand that, but this guy is like uh, you know strong GM strength suddenly in those positions. He, right. he becomes like he's already you know. He he's turning fifty and he's twenty five thirty. He's he's a pretty damn strong IM with two GM norms. Okay, so he's he's really a GM strength player. Right. Okay. And uh, although you know, like me, he's over the hill. He's fifty. I'm 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 almost sixty. So uh, we're both over the hill. But uh, and we both were GM strength when we were in our prime. But. Um, no, it's it's very difficult. If a guy wants to create unsound chaos, it's very easy to do. But I'll take that though, as long as the chaos is in my favor, I'll take it. Right. That's that's start. what I was trying to get at. Yeah. yeah. He has a, a he has an unbelievably hard time making it chaotic without me having the the natural advantage because I'm not, I'm doing everything natural. I'm I'm in harmony with the position. Uh, just. The anarchy in itself means that you're doing something that's jarring and against the grain of a position, correct? Right. So that that means he's doing something probably unsound. I mean, I mean every single time I lose a game to Aldama, I come home and uh, you know, you put it on the on Komodo and oh I'm you know, oh you were up plus three at one point, you know, you want to pull out the remainder of your hair. Right, but he he's so tricky that the plus three is very hard to convert, you know, yeah. because it's complete chaos. And the other thing is, you you know, during the game, you don't know that you're plus three. You a lot of times, I think I'm busted when I'm plus one or plus two. I I I actually think I'm worse. Hmm. I just our last game, um, I held a draw, okay, and I and I. I, with great relief, I held a draw. I missed the win at the end in time pressure, but I held the draw. He had pressure the whole game. I put it on the computer. He had no pressure. It was compl- I was completely fine the whole game. I just thought he had pressure. Dub- dubs are very uh, pessimistic about their assessment, and Hawks, of course, think they're genius. They're all geniuses, so they they can be down a piece and think they have a winning attack. So it 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 seeps into our into our assessment too. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you think you've scored against him overall? Well, I think he has a plus score mainly because uh, of the age differential. Yeah. I, it, I, I, I almost always lose in it, it, due to time pressure. I, I nearly always outplay him. I'm stronger strategically. Okay. And stronger, maybe stronger in the ending. Um, and much stronger in the opening because I write a zillion chess books. So, you know, I have a lot to draw on. Uh, he's not a opening guy. He just kind of BSs his way through the opening. Right. Um, and so he's nearly always equal when he's white and nearly always worse when he's black. Uh, but, uh, then he just sort of adds some kind of poison to the position, you know, hmm. and uh, he, his main strength is he just keeps complicating, complicating, makes me eat up my clock. And, um, you know, in blitz, I'm actually slightly better than him. I can beat last time we played last two matches. We played, um, I beat him in, in, uh, in blitz. But uh, the problem is in time pressure, it's not, 5-5 five, five game or a 3-3 three, three game, what always happens is uh, he has 8 and I have 2. Right, you know? yeah. So it's a, it, it, I am a better blitz player, but not when he has 8 minutes and I have 2. That's yeah. the problem, you know. 
Yeah, that game forty-five. It's managing the time is a, its own its own skill right there with end games and middle games and. Yeah, and I have a I have kind of a dreamy uh, personality, and so the problem is the the dreaminess uh, sort of enters the game too, and I'm I'm not very good with my clock. I often look up and I go, "Oh my God, I'm down fifteen minutes." You know? Right. How did that happen? I I swear I took one minute on my last move, but I took eight, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you're pretty good at end games, and we have another question from a supporter mm-hmm. of the podcast from from Neil Bruce. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, Neil asks, he says, uh, <clears throat> besides reading your first step fundamental endings, which I enjoyed, what else would you recommend a player under 2,000 do to strengthen end game abilities? Um, the main... The main way to get better in endings is to study the endings of the great players. Uh, Rubenstein, uh, Capablanca, Fisher, Carlson, of course. Uh, Those four. If you study those four, uh, like hit the database or buy books on them and concentrate on the end game, not in the earlier part of the game. You know, the the games of, of Rubenstein, the earlier parts of the games are not all that valuable, like, uh, because chess knowledge is so far advanced now that they're going to be making what we consider silly mistakes, like strategic errors or just moves a club player wouldn't do. But their endgame play is, is unbelievable. The, you know, the endgame theory hasn't altered all that much in the last hundred and something years. So, uh, if you study, if you do, and I mean a deep study, hit the database, call up all of Rubenstein's games, go through all of them and just start, you know, run your, run your, um, your chess base until the end game starts and then go through the end game and then repeat it with the computer on first, first without computer, then with computer. And of course, annotated games are, are much better than uh, unannotated. Um, analysis, by the way, is uh, n- is the least important part of a book. That's what I'll, I... I was just talking to um, David... Uh, David... Uh, oh, what's his last name? N- Nastasio? Is that yeah. it? Uh, he, he just was... Uh, messengered me this morning about that, and about uh, the importance of analysis... And I told him uh, analysis is actually the least important part of a book because in a few years, the engines are much stronger and your analysis is all wrong. It's always all wrong. Yeah. Okay. If you look at Botvinnik's analysis on a computer, you know, he like of his uh, matches, it's completely wrong. Even Kasparov's great predecessors, if you bought the book in 2002, uh, his computer is just infinitely weaker than like Komodo 13, for instance which is kind of like that alpha zero hybrid that they're trying to go for. Uh, but it's crazy strong, the computer today compared to 2002. So analysis will always be, be the least important part of a book. I remember I got this review of my four nights book where um, the, the, it wasn't like a terrible review, but he said the analysis is horrible. Well, you know, I wrote that book like when in 2011, and he reviewed it like uh, last year, so of course his computer is just a million times stronger. So he's going to find all sorts of holes in the analysis. Right. And uh, Jeremy Silman told me the same thing. You know, he wrote uh, "Reassess Your Chess" in the late '80s, right? When no computers used, and uh, people, you know, give him a one-star review and saying, "Oh my God, the analysis is terrible." My computer says this, right. but it's that same delusion where you think you would have found that computer's move. You would not have, you know, if an IM didn't find it. If a strong IM like Jeremy didn't find it in the late '80s, you wouldn't have found it, probably. You know. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading uh, Timmons Titans right now, and he mm-hmm. talks about great predecessors a bit, and he's kind of laments that very fact. He laments that that Kasparov was leaning on this uh, 2002, 2003 uh, era engine for a lot of the analysis. And he's, he sort of, um, he implies that it would be better if Kasparov just did his own analysis because now when yes. you look at it, it kind of, uh, yes, exactly correct. The pros and the 
explanations are all that matters in, in, in a book. That's the weakness of great predecessors is it's heavily uh, analysis based. And therefore, each year it gets worse. You see what I mean? Like, I, I mean, of course, I think it's a brilliant series. Don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing the series. I think it's a, a, a phenomenal series. But the weakness of it is the, the heavy reliance on analysis where it's just reams of analysis. I make the same mistake in some of my books. I think I was way too heavy on the analysis in my Fisher book. Um, and uh, I, I've been trying to lean more to, to verbal explanations and, and just light analysis, just very light analysis. Let the, let the reader put it on his own computer, his or her own computer, and let it go. Yeah, and especially these days with like uh, ch- looking at books on chessable and forward chess and stuff like that. I mean, exactly. often often you're reading it like sitting in a chair, and you can just flip on the engine as as you read right. it on on one of these um these programs or these browsers and uh, these apps, I should say, and then then you'll you'll get the most current uh, computer analysis. Exactly. The the worst thing the computers have done to us chess players is. Uh, we it turns us all into this narcissist where we all believe we're stronger than Magnus Carlsen, okay? Because Carlsen missed that move, me and my computer saw it, you know. Right. So we're stronger than, than Magnus. They, I mean, it's a it's a subconscious thing, of course. We don't actually believe that, but subconsciously you do believe it, you know. If you if you keep that computer on all the time, you believe that you actually found the move and you did not. Yeah. Um, so Cyrus, if you're up for it, a couple more topics, cause, sure. uh, cause you've led such a, such a full life in chess. I mean, four decades, so many books, um, uh, Actually, five decades. I started chess when I was like eight. Right. Of course. Yeah. Sorry. Teaching for four decades. Oh, teaching for four. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Um, so I came across a couple of stories in, uh, in, um, in your writing and, uh, old interviews. So, mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned you, you met Boris Baskey a couple of times. Yeah. Just a wonderful human being. I mean, uh, I, he's actually an incomprehensible human being uh, in that he's very kind and he's very humble. Okay, now, I don't understand that. If, if you're the world champion, your life from that point on is just adulation, right? Like you, like, you are wonderful. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. Like, everybody you meet tells you that, okay? How on earth do you remain humble when you're the world champion? Okay, like, I mean, how is it possible? Yet Anand seems to be a humble world champion. There seems to be, like, many. Yeah. And I think that's an extraordinary thing. I think that's far uh, – it, it's actually a greater human achievement than what he did in chess. I, I think it's remarkable. The fact that you you're still a kind, humble person – even though you became world champion, because I, I think I, I would think ninety five percent of us would be, you know, thinking we're pretty great, right? right. I mean, <laughs> That's a good point. So, what were the circumstances? How did you meet him? Oh, I I had that uh, chess column for uh, Copley News Service, the, my syndicated column, and uh, he came to San Diego, and uh, I got a tip that he was here. He was just visiting a friend. And uh, I called, I got the house number and I called the number. He was staying with some friend and the, and the guy exploded because I like, how did you get this number? I'm going to call your editor. I'm going to you know, like, oh really? My editor will chew me out for trying to get an interview. Right, really? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> anyway, uh, Boris overheard the call. Like, he was about to slam the phone down on me and Bo- uh, like, he actually did. But then he called back um, and said Bo- Boris overheard and said he'll do the interview, you know. <laughs> That's and, great. Uh, uh, and uh, like I say, the, the guy is just a wonderful human being. I met him again in uh, 2006 in Reno. Um, and uh, Igor Ivanov, uh, Grandmaster Ivanov, was dying of uh, esophageal cancer. He, he had a terminal um, terminal. Uh, Man, I'm I'm having a senior moment. Terminal something, but like you know, diagnosis. 
prognosis. Yeah. <laughs> See, you th- this this is why old age sucks, man. <laughs> you know, if, you terminal, terminal. Like, if this were a game 45, you would have just like, hung a piece. But <laughs> Yeah, it's like, oh my God, like, come on, I'm a writer. <laughs> anyway, um, I shouldn't be laughing about this subject also, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, Igor was dying of... Uh, of uh, esophageal cancer and uh, uh, Boris was just so compassionate with him you know uh, he was so kind to him and uh, the uh, we just got together I, I was with uh, John Donaldson there too and uh, we just got together there at, at Reno for a short while wow My, any other um, like stories of uh, meeting world champions or other um you know speaking of senior moments uh other famous um chess players uh i who have i met uh i think he's the only world champion i've met i played kasparov on icc uh three blitz games and miraculously uh scored one and a half but the but uh I had an enormous advantage because I did not know I was playing Kasparov. I would have scored zero, 100%. Yeah, if I, one of the secret I, accounts I, back well, in the I day. Would, I would have been crushed all three games if I'd known. But what happened was the next day, ICC said anyone who played Dahlia on the... You I know, remember yesterday. that name, early 2000s, right? He Yeah, and he tricked everyone because uh, Dahlia was apparently... It was a GM, okay? The, right. the, the, whoever Dahlia was is a GM, but, uh, you know, just some ordinary GM, not some, you know, world-class GM. And so he took Dahlia's rating, and so I wasn't intimidated. I, I, I was a really, really strong chess play, uh, uh, blitz player in the 90s. I could hang with world-class players. And I beat most GMs in matches in, in blitz in the 90s. I was much stronger in blitz always than uh, than uh, tournament. I, I think because I have a chronic back issue, uh, and so I, I always play in pain, so it affects the the quality of the play in long games. But uh, <clears throat> so I wasn't intimidated because my rating was was the same as this GM, and so we broke even. I thought nothing of it, you know. But uh, I was the only one to break even besides Tony Miles. Tony scored one and one. He he was a good friend of mine too. Yeah, um... uh, we used to analyze together on ICC in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, just before he passed away. So would you just do it in the little <laughs> chat box, or were you on Skype or whatever? Skype didn't exist. Yeah, I was going to say. I know it's hard to I believe that Skype didn't exist at one yeah. point, but no, we, we would just type. That's wow. it. Amazing. We, we would analyze. He actually approached me and he said, I would, uh, I'm interested in chess lessons, you know? Huh. Um, I mean, he was joking, of right? Course. Yeah, but he but wanted he, to work. He together. wanted me to. He he wanted me to work with him on the slob. Okay, because uh, especially this one line in the slob that I play, I, I, I in my slob book I call it uh, Tony's big. I call the line Tony's big adventure. In fact, good good name for a good hook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So one other story that piqued my interest was uh, in, I think it was the same interview with uh, David Nastasio of Georgia Chess News. You you talked about growing up in Montreal and like, you know, like a lot of us, you got bit by the chess bug um, mm-hmm. and, and you, you ended up playing some games for money like uh, in downtown Montreal. Well, I made a heck of a lot more money than working at McDonald's because I, I was, uh, like I say, I, I was always way better in Blitz than I was in my tournament. Like I, I was probably rated... Uh, 1500 but i but for some weird reason i maybe maybe a little higher than that maybe 1800 um uh, when i was like 14 years old i i was a very late uh i was not a gifted prodigy let me tell you that <laughs> um but i could hang with masters in blitz for some reason and so um i i would just play people for quarters or 50 cents a game or a dollar a game and i would make you know uh, 20, 30 bucks a day, which, you know, in, uh, 1974, that what was the minimum wage? Probably a dollar, dollar 75, dollar 50 an hour. So it was a heck of a lot better way of making money than, uh, working, you know, a summer job as a kid. And what was, um, 
Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think in the same interview, your your dad had a reasonably successful small business. Um, right. Your parents were, you know, wouldn't have wouldn't have mm-hmm. minded if you pursued careers other than chess. So did, how did they feel about you spending all your time gambling and, you know, even if you're making money, but all your time? Uh, they did summer. not like it. Yeah. They did not like it. They did not like chess. I, I, uh, I, I, I lost my father in 2016 and my mother this year. And, uh, this, uh, so I can say this without fear that she's listening now, you know, but, uh, oh my God, they, they did not like my chess. They did not encourage it very much. Uh, they wanted me to take over the business. It was sort of like a, like a thing they had in their head. And, uh, I, I just found business unbelievably boring. I, I tried, you know, I tried to, I worked with them for about a year. I took a year off college and worked with them when they uh, started their company in San Diego. And, you know, the days were just boring and long. And I thought there, I, there's no way I'm going to spend my life doing this. It, it's, it's too much. I don't care if I make a, a six figure income, you know, I, I don't care. It, it, it's, it's torture and it's not worth it. So, uh, I preferred being broke and happy to, uh, rich and, uh, unhappy. My, my brother kind of lucked out in that he took over the business and he loves business. He has an MBA he loves right. business. So, uh, he's rich and happy. You yeah. Know? So, well, yeah. If you can pull that off, great, but it's good that you had right, that perspective. Right. Um, it was just torture for me. I mean, I like, you know, every, Every night I wanted to come home and I'd go to Home Depot and buy a rope to hang myself at when I worked for my parents. It's just like, oh, my God, like it, it just felt like life was meaningless, you know. Yeah. So I, I didn't care about uh, color separations and, you know, even then I was a writer, but I didn't want to I didn't want to write advertise, you know, advertising copy i didn't want to write crap like that like my father was a a writer too you know but he but he loved copywriting and i thought copywriting is super boring you know yeah. well uh, looking at it from the other side so spending 40 hours a week writing and 20 teaching and you know with five decades spent in chess do you do you ever get burnt out on chess I, it's really catching up with me. I, I get burned out on chess a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all that's in front of my eyes. Right. Uh, and I have other interests. I, I have, uh, you know, Buddhist practices I, I do for hours and hours a day. And I, I also, uh, am a heavy reader. I try to read about an hour and a half to two hours a day. I, I feel like it's like food for the mind. I, yeah. I have to read. I, I've been a reader since I was a little kid, you know. I, ca- I can't imagine, like, it, it just doesn't feel right when I don't read that day. And I don't read chess. I yeah. read anything else. I, I read everything else. So what are you into? Just, Nonfiction, fiction, both? Everything. I, I Mostly mostly fiction, but I read, uh, I'll read like a, 2000 year old buddhist scripture and i'll i'll read uh, a sci-fi i'll read a science book i'll you know mo- mostly fiction though i mostly like fiction it just i i like the feeling of uh, of being taken somewhere else out of your mundane life to a more interesting one mm-hmm. yeah it, it's a good feeling and it probably doesn't hurt your writing either to just be reading all the time i, I think it's actually necessary for your writing. I, I, I think I would not write. Uh, actually, I'm sure the the twenty percent that hate me would <laughs> would be okay with me if I if I stopped reading because it, it it would take away the creativity. I think. I think part of it is it it it, it feeds creativity into your mind, and I, I think it's just a necessary component for any writer. I, I I suspect that all writers read heavily. I'm I'm not maybe not chess writers because it's it's a different kind of writing. But mine is actually closer to fiction. My my chess books are not like normal chess books. They're they're actually like a you know it's it, they're written in a novelistic style or short story style, not a chess book style. Yeah, not they're not like a technical, <laughs> you know. Right, right. Like, there, there's actual writing in there. Yeah. You know? Um, And one other thing, Cyrus, you mentioned just before we were recording that you've recently, uh, in air quotes, as you said, come out as uh, someone who's uh, been diagnosed as autistic. 
Um, right. I, I hid it uh, for so long. Uh, my, you know, my brother and sister right now don't know, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I told my wife about two years ago, and, we, and uh, we'd been married for 33 years, and uh, I told my son, too. And uh, my wife, the first thing she said was, now it all fits. And my uh-huh. son said exactly the same thing. Oh, interesting. Thing. Oh, now, why, you know, how could I have not seen it, you know? <laughs> the, the, the thing is, um, I'm, I'm an autistic, I'm a high-functioning autistic savant. This is what my, my doctor said. Um, it, it's the reason I can write the chess books in three months. And it, I, I think it's also the reason people find my chess books so weird. It's because I am weird. My brain doesn't, uh, isn't normal. It, it, it thinks along different lines, and uh, it, it's it's a curse and a blessing. It, it's a curse in that uh, in some technical, simple technical things, uh, I have the mind of like maybe a three or four year old. You can teach me, and I learn. Next day I forget. Next day I forget. It's just like that. And in other things, it's like I can. Uh, I'm a savant in other things, okay? Like, I can see the entire book in my head. After after I get the skeleton of the book, after about a week, I can kind of visualize the entire book in my head. Not the details, but I, I see the entire book. I, I don't know how to describe it, but everything sort of clicks, and I know what comes after. Like, I, I, I know... I, I write something, and I know immediately what comes after. It's hard to describe, but... Uh, it's almost like I don't write the books. It's like they write themselves. I, I just, my hands just sort of type, right? And the book types out. You know, it's it, it's just hard to describe. But I, I attribute that also to the autism. So it's like it's a curse and a blessing. Um, I, I, Sorry, I had I a just... lot of trouble in school with it. You know, when I was young, I had a terrible time in school where I would only score A's and D's. There, were, there, there was no in between, and the D's were probably mercy D's. They probably deserved F's, you know. Yeah. But anything with math based, I was in trouble, and anything that's verbal based or memory based, I I, I was like an A. Hmm. Like anything with history, English, writing, uh, always always an A. Like I, I had a four point in college in every subject except for math, where, where I barely passed the math. I I needed tutoring. And I failed the first time, and the second time I I, just, I barely passed, and I would say a week after the exam I'd forgotten everything I learned, and so uh, math was excruciatingly hard for me throughout uh, high school and college. College I didn't need it because I was a literature and writing uh, major, but I you still have to pass the the basic entrance math, and that's what I had trouble with. Wow. That's interesting. And when did you? So, you your doctor more recently said that you're a um, high functioning autistic person. But when did you get an inkling prior to that that that? Oh, I knew. I knew since I was a kid. I I mean, I didn't know that it was autism, but I knew something was like really wrong. I I could, for instance, if a teacher yelled at me when I was you know let's say eight years old, um, I could just make the teacher disappear. I would I would like go into a trance. And the teacher would just be gone. I would not hear the teacher. I would not see the teacher. I sort of went into a, a, like a meditative trance. And I actually began meditation at age, uh, I think, maybe uh, 10 or 11, like at a very early age. And it was an attempt to get a, a grip on the autism. Wow. And uh, I, I wanted to be able to control my mind. I, I didn't like this feeling of being out of control and... Uh, and helpless, and uh, it 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 sort of normalized me, and it it let me uh, fool people. I fooled my wife for thirty three years. You know, mm. well, not really, not really. She knew something was off. Okay, she knew something was off. Like, it, like for instance, um, I can be driving to the gym. Okay, and I've been going to the same gym. It's three miles from my house, and uh, I've been driving to this gym for 20 years now, okay? I could be driving there, and halfway there, I'll forget how to get there. Mm-hmm. And I have to just sort of pull over. And uh, 
say, oh, crap, you know, like, how yeah. do I get to the gym? And I have to kind of, when I, when I kind of calm down and go into a, a meditative state, then I remember. But it's, it's, um, it, it's almost like you're, like, like you're a baby in some things. Like, I feel like I'm, I, I have the intelligence of maybe a two, three, or four-year-old in some things. Hmm. And in other things, I'm better than, I, I think, anyone in the world. So wow. it's a it's a mixed blessing. That's really interesting. So how did you come about trying meditation when you were eleven? Um, uh, how did you, I, how took, did... I took uh, I took a class in it. My parents. I actually talked my parents into it. Uh, one other one other aspect of the the autism is uh, I can learn things via study, um, and it's as if I've done them. For instance, uh, I studied martial arts because I was bullied a lot, probably partially because I was Indian growing up in the 60s, okay, in, a, in an affluent area where I was the only non-white kid pretty much in, my cl- in every class, so I was bullied a lot. Uh, but, but secondly, people just knew something was wrong because of the autism. I, I would say inappropriate things. I still do. I, I still write them probably, you know, <laughs> but... Uh, I, I needed to defend myself, so I started studying jujitsu and martial arts, different martial arts, kung fu, and uh, I, I, I never practiced. I never ever took a class in it. But after a while, I could beat three, four kids up. You know, like if wow. three or four attackers up, I could beat them. When I was uh, forty-eight, I sparred with a um, a thirty-two-year-old third-degree black belt, and I beat him. Hmm. And so I. I, you know, I'm a white belt. I've never taken a class in my life. My son actually took Shaolin Kung Fu for many, many years, and I watched the classes, like, intently. And I, I did practice with him at home, but I've never taken a class. But I did, you know, if I could beat a third-degree black belt who's much younger than me, I did attain a certain level of martial arts then in, in Shaolin Kung Fu. Uh, but, it, it, but that's also the autism. Somehow... Um, it's like I can read a book about driving a car and then drive a car, you know, without yeah. practicing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I, I, I visual, like everything's like in my mind. I visualize it, and then it's as if I've done it. Man, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't imagine what that must be like. I mean, I think there are certain characteristics that I've found. Um, more common among chess players, like the thing you mentioned about driving and forgetting where you're going. I think that, and oh, the sort a of, common thing? Okay. I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't I go that doubt... far, but a lot of chess players are renowned for not being good drivers. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I'm, like I'm even, at... even super strong ones. Oh, really? I, I'm actually, I've actually got incredibly fast, like crazy hyper fast reflexes, but I am a bad driver because I, uh, my mind wanders. Yeah, constantly, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that's the <clears> issue. <throat> Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I really appreciate your, your talking about it. I mean, I'm sure there, there's listeners out there and, you know, f- fans of yours who, who have experienced maybe, maybe not, not something on, maybe not the exact same thing, but similar feelings or feelings of being an outsider, or certainly, uh, you know, people who've been bullied. So, I mean, uh, sunshine is the well, best disinfectant. And uh, I mean, it seems like you've, uh, you've, you've done well for yourself. Well, thank you. I, I it, it was more of a cathartic thing. I I just needed to do it because I was sick of hiding it from everybody. You know, I just I was just sick of it. But uh, you you th- there is a subtle alteration I notice in how people view you. Like I, I even my son, I he views me differently now. I could see it. You know, like he luckily he won't watch this podcast, so right. he won't hear this. And but, if he does, uh, there's no way he'll know, make it seventy five minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh it, people do view you differently w- once you tell them so th- there's a you know sometimes i do regret it but I, i've been telling people on facebook and and fa- you know friends i plan to tell my brother and sister next time i meet them you know so uh it's it's good it's it's like a burden that's off your chest yeah you know? and it's uh, but the, you're you're afraid everybody's going to think you're a freak you know and, and it's you're just different you're not a freak you're, you're just different you know yeah. i mean and we're all different in some ways so this is just right just your way 
Okay. Well, Cyrus, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I, Thank you. Likewise, Ben. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate your being so generous with your time. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to spice up their opening repertoire, um, you know, uh, the D4C4 book looks good. I mean, uh, you, uh, Thank you. you had some, I, you know, I used to play the Benoni, so I was... I saw you recommended the flick knife attack, the bishop, you know, the right. f4 and bishop b5, and that's definitely the one as a Benoni player you don't want to see recommended. <laughs> um, yeah, and- I could not find black equality in that line. I, I I tried and I tried and I tried. I cannot find a place where black equalizes in that line. Like if white plays it perfectly, black is in trouble. Yeah, well, there's the a there's a reason that it's, it can only be used as a su- surprise weapon uh, right, at the top right. level. Um, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, and then you've got the Samish against the Nimzo Indian. Um, well, the pseudo Samish. Yeah, not, the, the pseudo F three, I should say. Is, yeah, yeah, F three, not not the F three, then A three, not A three right away. Yeah, um, right. So yeah, fun stuff. Check that out. Check out Cyrus's other books. And you said you, you're working on two more right now. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm finishing up uh, opening repertoire modern defense. This is a, a repertoire book. book called, on the modern it's a little bit weird it's 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 almost like a hybrid perk modern book in the first half <coughs> excuse me i um i switched to perk a lot which is you know a big taboo for modern players but i it's a, it's a it's a very different repertoire than what you're used to and in the in the second half uh i actually pick a benoni but with the knight on e7 Hmm. But against queen pawn openings, I, it's a it's a Benoni system with black, but with the knight on e7 rather than f6. Interesting, which I like. Okay. And the other book, uh, it hasn't even been named, uh, but this one is for the the opening repertoire. Modern is for every man, and for new in chess, uh, I'm starting a book on winning streaks, like great winning streaks throughout chess history. <clears throat> you know, starting with Morphy. Uh, 1857 uh, American Chess Congress, and then uh, going on to Steinitz's match with Blackburn, 7-0 match with Blackburn, like that. You know, great winning streaks throughout history. Wow, that sounds interesting. And mm-hmm. I guess with with your workload, we don't have to wait that long for it. You know? No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Six months or less, I would guess. <laughs> um, uh, in that range, yeah. <laughs> cool. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that, Cyrus. And if people want to reach you or keep up with you, um, is there a preferred method? Well, I'm I'm on Facebook. Okay. Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Although I'm running out of friends, I'm 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 fast approaching that five thousand friend mark, and then I have to do a purge. You know, people I don't talk to too much. But, right. But I'm on Facebook. If you're a chess player, friend me. Okay, listeners, get in while you can. Okay. (laughs) All right. So, Thanks a lot, Ben. Okay, Cyrus. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes my producer, Matthew Passy, Geert Vandervelt for supplying the theme music, my wonderful guests, of course. And I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether it's on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, telling an actual friend, an actual person about it. Every little bit helps grow the show. But most of all, I want to thank people who support the show financially. Without your financial support, this show would not be possible. I love doing it, but it is a lot of work. So I most of all want to thank Chessable for their support. And I also would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough. Benjamin Handelman, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, I am Dimitri Schneider, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Sidney Andrews, Thomas Tachenko, and Todd Bryant. And I'd also like to thank the following Patreon partners. You guys are Aaron Wafflar, Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adam Vrancouge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, BetterChessTraining.com, Bill Moran, Brett Howard Lynn, Brett Zeldo, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Bumgardner, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood. I am Christoph Zalicki, a.k.a. Chess Explained. Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am Elect, Donnie Ariel, the Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Frank Tortoris, MD, 
Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt of Chessable.com, Gerard Barda, Giovanni Russo, Greg Natal, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Ogard of Quality Chess Publishing, James Bonastia, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Jen Shahadi, Jerry Wells, JJ Strand, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovyutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Boyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, The Mysterious Moon Master 9000, The Legend Grows, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paolo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Brandy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Van Kooj, William Peterson, Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. Catch you guys next week. Yeah.